I actually want to build something a little bit bigger and more important. And I don't think that's something that I can do in isolation. I think it's probably going to mean working with other people, collaborating, and truly creating something useful. I just don't know what that is yet. That's Kat Mulvihill. Kat, as you'll get to find out in this episode, is the definition of a multi-passionate person and entrepreneur. Kat is someone that I've gotten to know a little bit through Notion and meeting her in person at the Craft and Commerce Conference by ConvertKit. I admire Kat for a lot of reasons, but one of those reasons is that a lot of multi-passionate innovators can learn a ton from Kat. She's someone who has studied and experienced so many different areas and puts them all together in ways that only Kat can. I don't know any other people who are an expert in Notion, can present incredibly well virtually, and would come up with the idea to knit on Twitch while talking about pop culture. In this conversation with Kat, we talked about her journey as a multi-passionate entrepreneur, why a company should consider using Notion, and why she's thinking a bit bigger these days. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Kat Mulvihill. You have a really, I think, cool story. I didn't realize how much you've learned, like learned through school and all the different pathways you've gone through. So to give people a little bit of context, so you grew up in Ontario, Canada, which is not too far from where I grew up, just in a different country. Um, <laughs> and then you studied just a lot of different things, so, you know, physiology and psychology, then a workplace and adult learning, then an MBA in organizational behavior and human resource management. And then you studied food and nutrition, but here you are online teaching virtual presentations in Notion. Yeah. So what were these early influences that maybe cause these twists and turns or even get you into like this now entrepreneurship work? Yeah, well, I really started out in, well, in science, if we go way back, I thought I might be a doctor like almost every undergrad science student at some point in their life. Then I worked at a hospital and realized, no, this is not for me. And it was actually working at the university over the summer. I was in a program where we welcomed all of the new incoming students as I was a senior year, senior student. And one of the things I did was every, I think once a week or so, I would present to the parents. So any parents, guardians who would show up with their student, we would run a separate session for them. And so it was led by a staff member, but they would always ask questions to the students. And I always loved those presentations. And I remember there was one person in particular who saw me later that afternoon, complimented how I did when I was presenting in front of the parent program, and then said, what kind of work do you want to do? And genuinely at that time, I was a little bit lost because I now knew I did not want to work in a hospital and I really wasn't sure. And I remember him saying, well, you know, there are there are programs and jobs where you can work at a retreat center and you could just run professional development for people. And I said, okay, hold on, that's a job? <laughs> I did not know that was a job. And as soon as that seed was planted, I'll never forget that moment. I could picture where we are because it was such an aha, eye-opening moment of there are so many different jobs out there. It's just not the stereotypical ones that you learn about. And when I first graduated, I started in recruitment. So I was going around to high schools and I was talking to students. And so the presentation part was really core to what I did. And I was working at the university and they offered the chance for more education. So that was one of the benefits when you work at a university. You can usually take school for free or at least subsidized. So I started studying education. And then I thought, you know, I really do love the training aspect and I love teaching people but I want to get more into that organizational development. So maybe I'll study human resources. I just, I'm constantly learning and curious. And so that was the motivation is the training aspect to go in that direction with the MBA. And that was also really eye-opening because it also gave me some insight into running a business, which I never thought, honestly, during the whole MBA, did not even think about or consider entrepreneurship. <laughs> I just thought I will happily work for someone else. The foray into nutrition was more of a personal thing around, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. I started learning more about the impact of what, what we put in our body, how it affects our health, especially with autoimmune conditions. So that was more of a following my curiosity from a personal, a really personal perspective. And I did that for a while. And what was nice about the nutrition, I, I guess sidestep, I would say, because it did not last long was that it was a nice gateway into the idea of you could run your own business 
Because if you are going to pursue nutrition and take on clients, you have to set up a business. And I actually did do that. I did that part time while I was still working full time at the university. And it really did teach me a lot quickly about running a business, setting up a website, trying to land clients. And and eventually I just realized, OK, if I'm part time, part time nutrition and then part time running sessions and doing training, corporate training, team training, it really I can't do both very well. So then I decided to let go of nutrition and just really focus on running my own business. So early on when I did leave the university and went full time with entrepreneurship, I was focusing on corporate development, small group programs, and it really was personal development. So understanding yourself, understanding others, how do we communicate? How do you work kind of with yourself instead of against yourself? And during the pandemic, I everything changed and went online and I just thought, okay, I really need to just create an effective, engaging experience because my very first booking after everything shut down, looked at my calendar and I saw it's three hours. It's a half day corporate training and it's on Zoom now. How can I make it feel like it's not a three hour Zoom training? And so I spent weeks just trying to figure out what are all the things I can do? What are the tools I can use? How do I make this engaging? How do I have people leaving at the end feeling maybe energized instead of completely drained? And then as I did those, the more I did them, the more people would approach me asking questions about how did you do that? You had your slides beside you on the on your video and I've never seen that before. And I then that's when I started to recognize, okay, maybe there's something different I can do and teach in an area that right now there's a real need, which was the online presentation space, needed some help and I loved teaching it. So I just completely switched my business in 2021. And then that's around the time that I found Notion. And I started, I was just such a nerd about Notion that I dove in real deep (laughs) and then started teaching that part-time as well. And just, I, I guess I follow my pursuits and I follow my curiosity and the under, the undercurrent is that I love teaching people and presenting in front of groups and trying to make their lives better. So in a previous episode with Jason Kerr, he mentioned a lot like, hey, if he get asked all the time about like, how do I become an innovator? How do I do this kind of work? His answer was, oh, you like there's classes, there's, you know, there's books, there's all these things, different things you can read. But the main thing is you have to be naturally curious. And it's so evident with how you're operating, right? It's like, I'm just going to be naturally curious and kind of follow that pathway. But maybe even like double click into that a little bit too. How do you like, right, there's, it's really easy to be exploring every little thing and then try to do too much, especially if you're like, oh, I have this interest in food nutrition. Like, so how do you maybe like keep that focus? And so that way it's not just like a rabbit hole that means that goes nowhere, but you're also still like staying that curious, but you know, staying focused as well. Yeah, I'm still learning. I can find myself envying the people who just have one clear focus and they just follow that because that is not really how I'm wired. And it takes a lot more effort in order for me to focus and zero in. And I don't know that I've ever had one singular focus the entire time I've worked on anything. And I guess part of me accepts that, yes, I am a multi-passionate person. I am going to be curious about a lot of things. I can't do all of them, but I also don't like to limit myself to only one thing at a time. And I do think it leaning into this is sort of my reality. This is how I'm wired. And when I try to shut out everything else, I struggle and I can actually feel really stagnant with just one thing. So I think allowing myself this space to explore something else, but recognizing you you cannot explore three, four five things at a time. So I try to reduce it down a little bit. The other I guess I try to remind myself that you also don't have to turn everything that you like or enjoy into a business. You know, I I love knitting as just a personal pastime. I love creating beautiful objects, gifting them or making them for myself. And there was a brief period where I thought oh, I should turn this into a channel. I should st- start a you know Twitch stream where I knit live and talk about pop culture. And, and I'm constantly trying to turn the thing that I care about into something. And then I recognized I do not have to do that and nor should I. And so recognizing when is it a real pursuit for career or professional calling versus just something that's part of your life that you enjoy, that you make time for, 
it doesn't have to turn into something. And I think that was also really helpful to just, I guess, pump the brakes a little and not feel that or, or just notice when you have the urge to turn it into something because it just does not have to turn into something. One of the things about your knitting that I loved is you, you put it in one of your YouTube videos recently and you just like popped it in quickly. So I did. <laughs> if you're watching this, you should go look it up and find that video because it, it's super entertaining and just like a pop moment. I think um, I think that was the teleprompter follow up question. Yep. Because someone asked about Twitch. And so I, I gave that little nod to the fact that I briefly considered a Twitch channel. And then I, yeah, I cut this quick cut away to my knitting. It was a very entertaining because it caught me like off guard watching it. Yeah. So I guess in that too, right? So you're talking right about like these pivots and things like that. So, you know, is it, just, you mentioned like a nudge, is it just a nudge that we know how to pivot or like, or it's an experience more of the art of innovation huh. or is there like specific things that you're thinking about or like, Ooh, like, no, this is why I should pivot into, you know, the notion or virtual presentations. Like, it, are there certain things you're looking for? Like, Ooh, I actually should pivot into this. That's a good question. And the first major pivot I mean, letting go of nutrition was not as difficult as I thought, just because that was just so different of running workshops and running a nutrition practice part time. So letting go of that was OK. But in 2020, I did struggle for a while. I would say probably three or four months of recognizing that one, I was not getting a lot of traction with what I was doing. And if I look back, I do believe that I had the capability maybe with a little bit of extra effort or trying some different tactics that I might have gotten some traction at some point. But I wasn't getting any at the time. And at simultaneously, I noticed people were asking me a lot of questions. They were coming to me for advice on virtual presentations. They were saying, how did you do that thing? How did you run that workshop? I've never seen that before. That is what prompted me to pay attention. And so I was noticing how am I helping people? What are people coming to me for over and over? And I also realized there was a very clear market. And the other stuff I was trying to do that the development aspect, I think, is important, but it's not very urgent for a lot of people. And when it came to presenting online during 2020 and 2021, that was actually urgent. People needed to know how to do it because they were being forced to do it. And also, it wasn't letting up anytime soon. And so I think once I learned about the concept of ikigai, it's the Japanese term where there's something that you love doing, you're good at doing, people want to pay you for it, and also the world needs it. I had sort of inadvertently stumbled into that, where by paying attention to what people are asking me about tells me that I'm good at it and maybe they're willing to pay for it. Maybe I can make a living doing this. But also noticing, do I enjoy teaching it was another really important component of it. And so when those things came together, then I just said, all right, we're going to do this. I'm just completely pivoting and changing everything. I changed my entire website. I changed my domain. I changed my email, all of it. And it paid off. It, I got traction right away because I was meeting a need. And, and I thought I was good at it. I still think I'm good at it. <laughs> with, the, with the Notion thing, it sort of, I wouldn't call it a full pivot because I still I do still teach about virtual pre presentations and it, it kind of fell into my lap where I had been doing consulting on the presentation side. So I was working with Notion Mastery and how do we make their training, improve their training experience. But at, the more I did that, the more I also started getting involved with designing the training and starting to look at, okay, how do we teach Notion and make it engaging? And so I sort of stumbled into that in a way and then I just really loved it and I noticed that same kind of thing people knew that I was really passionate about Notion they noticed I was an ambassador they maybe seen some of my content where I talk about it and then said okay I'm going to ask and I started to notice the same pattern was emerging as three years ago where a lot of the questions I'm getting are related to Notion and so I thought okay not going to completely abandon the virtual presentation aspect because I still do care about that. If, if I think it was really waning, then I would maybe close that door and let that be, but not yet. Uh, and so I have kind of embraced the fact that some people come to me for the presenting stuff and then some people want my help with Notion and I enjoy both and I'm letting myself do both, even though I think most business strategists would 
not would not really say that that is a great idea. So I don't necessarily recommend being known for more than one thing or trying to talk about more than one thing, but I'm just letting myself do it. And if it's my mistake, it's mine to make. Okay, time out. I wanted to just let you know that if you're looking to start your own venture, we have a free course at Station all about it. It'll help you get your foundation right with your own venture, especially if you're looking to be a bootstrapped venture. Again, it's completely free. Check it out in the description of this episode. Short time out over, back to the interview. I like that approach a lot. I, I know it's totally like right against business strategy. You should be known for one thing. I know like Jay, Jay Klaus talks a lot about like, you should be known for like one little statement. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, ooh, but we're, there's all like, I struggle with that one too. So I totally understand that. I think right from an, I, I personally come to you for both, right? So even like YouTube, I'll be like, ooh, what did Kat say about X, Y, and Z? I'll like look it up. Um, and also just now your LinkedIn posts, especially like I'm learning so much even just through that with you because even like the, you had just like, you can actually put the LinkedIn profile images as, you know, people's icons in Notion. And I was like, no way. And now my Notion databases look so pretty and nice right? and all of that stuff. So and I think with Notion, there's like, they're, they're shifting a lot, right? They're shifting into this more enterprise customer. They've had a lot of individuals, which I think the pitch for individuals is pretty simple for, for Notion. Like it's easy to pick up or easy enough to get pit started with notion yeah but the company side of it i think they're having an experience from what i can tell from like your st- like standpoint you've worked right with you know different corporate companies individuals like why would a company even like consider or like why would a company use notion for like their day-to-day that's a good question and it's not right for everyone for multiple reasons i would say at the moment it's still better for smaller or like medium let's say small and medium sized companies because once you start getting into access management etc you do really need to think about who is managing it who's administering it and also i would say notion still likes to move fast and they break things and for some companies that's just not an option so i think it really depends on the what does a company do what are what kind of work is it however I still think it's an incredible tool for having multiple things in one place because it can act as a repository for your documents and documentation. It can make them almost more of a living thing. So if you have all of your company policies somewhere, you can even just have a filtered view to say, show me all the policies that haven't been updated in six months and have it more recurring. Or if people are tagged and they're responsible for it, maybe let's say if we were working on a team, and I make some suggested edits to a policy, it could automatically tag you as the person who has to review it and say, hey, this, got, this just got edited. You need to review this and then you can change the status. So it's, it's a way of combining the actual sort of the company's center of truth, I guess you could say, with the action of it. Because often those are separate. So your task management, project management, often lives separate from your documentation and the the different documents that are necessary for your business to operate. In, In a way, this brings it all together and they can live in one place. So the place that you're managing the work is also the place that you're doing the work. And for me as a business owner, I run my entire business in Notion. And I love that when I have a project page, I can have all of the tasks, but I can also have all of the documents. I can build everything out in Notion And I'm not constantly switching from app to app to app to app. There's some really incredible advantages to Notion as a tool, but it's it's by no means perfect. It's not, I'm not sure there's any perfect solution. (laughs) And then the, the, the thing that I see is a gap in the training because it is not just a younger product, but it's also constantly evolving. And when I look back at some of my tutorials from a couple of years ago that I posted online, I mean, the amount that's changed just since I posted those is has been huge. And I would, you know, there wasn't even a status in one, one of my most popular videos that covers Notion tutorials. They didn't have a status button. You couldn't hide titles. You, you, you know, your link tables are just one thing at a time. And it's completely different and it's constantly changing. And so keeping people on top of that is challenging. A few weeks ago, I had Gareth Pronovos, who does a lot with Airtable, and he's been doing Airtable work for five years. And he mentioned the same thing. He's like, my videos from like five years ago look like like they're from the 90s, essentially. 
<laughs> That's the way I took it. And he's like, they look so old. And like these tools just adapt a lot of times. But I think one of the big differences, I think, from like Airtable and Notion here, right, is Notion, as you mentioned, right, there's hold your documents, they can hold this and this and that. And they're naturally horizontal versus like this, like, hey, we're gonna be good at one little thing. Mm -hmm. So for like companies, it's nice because like if you're looking to maybe consolidate tools, like Notion can do that. Same time when you're consolidating things, like like right, and they're moving fast, and they're a startup. They're definitely a startup. Things aren't always going to be in sync all the time. Yeah. Most ninety nine percent of the time, they're pretty good. But there's those little moments, like how did this happen to this, or like oh, this is completely different now. Yeah. So like I'm with you on like how Notion, yeah, they are they consolidate a lot, and I think from like like you mentioned, right, it's what type of company that is, and I think it's. If it's enterprise, if you're looking for security, all those different things, like in theory, it all's there, but then things will break down as we go here too. Yeah. And as you mentioned, right, there's there's no perfect tool in general. It's more just like, can you fit it into like, does your team actually like it too? I think is a, another thing to be thinking yeah. about. Well, I think, is your team open to it? I mean, technically, if you're a decision maker, you get to decide what software you're going to use and you should be investing some time and effort into making sure that your company, the people in your company understand how to use it, why we've chosen to use this. And you might have to invest in some training. But also the, a problem I see specifically with Notion is that it is so dynamic and customizable and personalizable. That's not a word. Pers you can personalize it. Is that having a lot of people have just enough knowledge to be dangerous. And when I say that, I mean, one, a lot of people can accidentally delete things. So there's that. So you have to, if you are working with a team, it's really important to understand the access, the permissions, the architecture of a space. There are strides that Notion is making to try to have that pieced out. But if someone doesn't understand who has permission to what, what are the different levels, it can be easy for someone to... Yeah, as I said, accidentally delete stuff or I'll see a lot of Notion spaces when I help people where there are just so many empty pages because people are just clicking on things and not realizing that they're just adding a whole bunch of empty pages and then they don't clean it up. So I think there needs to be someone who is responsible for sort of the maintenance and the upkeep if the team is big enough. And there almost always has to be a champion on the team. But also I've seen even popular templates that have proliferated on the Internet from Notion. And when I start to dig into those templates, they are actually creating bigger headaches than they are helping to solve because the creator of the template maybe is missing some principles around organization and systems. And I just, I think that can also be dangerous because it's such a popular tool and so many people are creating templates. But if, if they know how to use the tool alone, that's not enough to create an effective system that's actually going to save people time and solve their problems, it might actually end up creating more problems. And that to me, it's frustrating to watch as an observer because I'm a stickler <laughs> for those things, but a lot of people aren't. And it's, it might be because they don't know what they don't know. And that's, it's makes it kind of difficult. Whereas other software or tools that are out there, you have more guardrails on them because they are designed a very specific way. And so that's one of the trade-offs with Notion. It's kind of like having like a Squarespace versus like a Webflow, I feel like. Right, Webflow, you get like unlimited, do whatever, change every pixel where then like Squarespace, right? You get like, here's a template. Yeah. And the Notion templates are kind of trying to act that way as a Squarespace, but at the same time, you can still edit everything. And even for me, like I use Notion to manage everything for this, content and everything, but then it's like, ooh, too much content or too much, I made it too messy and I start deleting everything. And it's like, yeah. no, no, like you can't just delete everything. You have to like, that's the other part I think people get frustrated about. It's like, a, it's an iterative process rather than like, mm -hmm. hey, it's all done and we never change it again. It's like, it's a growing process. Yeah. Last question for you is, bigger question, is when you're done with all this work, what do you hope the impact is? Like, what do you hope you'll be able to tell yourself like mm -hmm. once you're finished with all this work? This is a very timely question because it recently dawned on me that I don't see myself as a content creator. So let me paraphrase or not paraphrase, but clarify by saying I do create content, 
But as I've been reflecting recently on what kind of business do I want to run, I am actually not interested in a business that is dependent on creating content to get in front of a bigger audience to create sort of traffic towards a digital product. And there is nothing wrong with that business type. It's just that it's a bad fit for me. And that's something that I've learned with my experience over the last few years as someone who puts out content, not, not hyper regularly, <laughs> by the way. And I think as I reflect on that, I realize as soon as it becomes an obligation to create constant or consistent content over and over in order to try and get in front of more people, that's not really the, the business that I want to run as an entrepreneur. And I think, to answer your question, I actually want to build something a little bit bigger and more important. And I don't think that's something that I can do in isolation. I think it's probably going to mean working with other people, collaborating, and truly creating something useful. And, and in my mind, that is probably an educational or training product. How do I help a lot of people? How do I solve problems? And how can I create something that is reliable, that's valid, that's repeatable, you can replicate it, and the, it's got underlying solid principles, and it's iterated to a point where I've really built a solid training product. I just don't know what that is yet, <laughs> because I've only just realized this recently. But it answers a question around, I would like to you know, retire one day and look back and have something that I really feel proud of. And I think when I see all of these creators on YouTube who are leaving, and I think it actually makes sense because it's still young. I mean, YouTube's been around for almost two decades, but we've never had people in the long term who've made a living off of content creation. And so now we're just starting to see, okay, what happens to people who've been on YouTube for 15 years and they're on this sort of content hamster wheel? What does that do to a person? And so that's actually been one of the things that's made me reflect recently of what's the type of business that I want to run? What can I see myself doing sustainably in 5, 10, 15 years? And I think really building something meaningful that's bigger than me creating content. I think that's really something that's become very clear to me. Now I just have to explore what that actually, what does it actually look like? But I think that's that's how I would answer that question, which would probably have been different a couple of months ago. Well, it fits, right? Like the curiosity piece, like we talked about at the very beginning, right? You're just like, I'm going to explore it and we're going to figure yeah. it out. And that's a lot of the journey. A big thank you to Kat for having this conversation. I learned a lot and I hope you learned something too. Let me know what you thought of this episode by leaving a comment or signing up for the station newsletter in the description. And let me know what you thought of the episode there. Thanks for watching and listening.